And I'll give you a few seconds to drop your answer in the chat. What do you think? Which one would contain the greater volume? By the way, we will call this one width and we'll call this one length. So this is length, this is width. So which one contains the greater volume? Go ahead and drop in your answers right into the chat and tell us what you think. And I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Jose interpret. I see some equals. So I don't want you to be embarrassed, but I've asked, as I said, 5,000 people this question, and it does not matter what the level of education is of the participant. The answer uh, that is most often given more than 90% of the time is they are equal. And the reasoning goes like this, 11 inches by eight and a half inches is the same as eight and a half inches by 11, right? So the reasoning is there. However, some of you may be surprised to learn that actually, in fact, they are not the same. And uh, the more important question for our purposes is, why as educators don't we know? You would think this would be something that anybody in the world would know. Why don't we know this answer? The reason I do this is not to embarrass anybody, but just to point out the importance of emphasizing curiosity and the desire to solve problems. We need to make sure that we incorporate that into our instruction. And uh, I'd like to ask you, why do you think we don't know the answer to this question? And I'd be willing to, to bet many of you had a teacher who said something like this to you. They said, we're going to have a test on the volume of cylinders tomorrow and I need you to memorize the formula. And guess what? You walked in and you took the test. And the moment that you were done with that test, what happened to your memorization of that formula? It probably went in one ear and out the other ear. And uh, that's very, very important to think about as a teacher, we need to provide purpose. This is what discovery does so well. Discovery education does really well. Rather than just saying, we need you to memorize the formula for the cylinder, we say something like this. We need you to design a vessel, a container that will transport water to people that need access to fresh water. And hopefully you can hear the difference. The difference here is we've given you reason and purpose. We have implied something to do and something to design. And that is what I hope to do here. Here's another reason why I think that you do not know the answer to this question or that anybody in the world doesn't know the answer to this question. It's because we still teach in this way. We teach 90 minutes of history separated from 90 minutes of math, separated from 90 minutes of literature. And do you all agree, by the way, that if we're gonna solve some of the world's most challenging problems, that it will require that we borrow from all of these disciplines Take COVID, for example. If we're going to solve COVID, we need to understand psychology, human behavior, sociology, social studies, mathematics, probability. We need to understand all of that. So my point is, this is kind of the way that we teach, and the world is more like this, right? So this is reality. We need to teach kids the intersection between the disciplines. So I'd love to ask what ideas you might have for encouraging curiosity in your home or in your school. This is a question that I would like you to ask. We do not often allow students questions to drive what it is that we teach. And I would say to you that if we did that, we increase motivation, we increase performance, we increase interest and investment in school. The kids want to learn if we do this. So a lot of times, if you look at the resources that are available to you through the TDI, they are influenced or inspired by the UN Sustainable Goals. These are the 18 most important problems, which if not resolved, will threaten the existence of humanity. Everybody can relate to the need for food and fresh water. 
and taking care of biodiversity and how are we going to get energy. So this is very, very important to make sure that we connect our teaching to what it is that kids care about. So I'd love to ask this question of every group that I have the privilege of interacting with. When is the last time you got very emotional or you actually cried a little bit when you read a scientific journal? When is the last time you cried when you read a scientific journal? And I bet the majority of you are saying, not very often. And your kids are exactly the same way. They do not necessarily care much about a scientific journal. They want to see things like people treating one another with empathy or reading a fantastic book or play or movie or doing work that really matters. So you get the point. I don't tear up and I am a nerdy scientist. I don't tear up when I read a scientific journal. I wanna know why it matters. So uh, that particular activity, by the way, I'm gonna let Dr. Stout talk to you about where you might find this in the TDI. Dr. Stout, if you will. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Corbin, for that. And, and especially thank you for uh, making the connection uh, among the various disciplines. I think it's so important. Um, so so often we teach in uh, what we call silos, um, where the uh, math teacher and the science teacher teach separately and never really talk to each other. Um, so what I want to do is make connections uh, between what Dr. Corbin has shared and uh, uh, the T and science textbook uh, that you all have available to you. Um, I've been working with the ministry since 2019 um, on this project, so I'm very familiar with uh, with the resources and uh, and with the staff there and um, the kind of work that you do in the classroom. <clears throat> what um, what Dr. Corbin just shared actually is available to you um, in in your uh, math tech book. And the concept uh, relates to uh, geometry and measuring of cylinders. Uh, specifically, um, in this, you can direct connection to math tech book unit three, concept 3.1. And this particular hands-on activity that's in the, that you're looking at here on the right is very similar and it replicates what Dr. Corbin just uh, demonstrated. One of the things I'd like you to consider today is as Dr. Corbin is presenting these, think of how you might use some of his activities and demonstrations to increase motivation among your students to read and learn more. Um, and that's a theme I'm going to come back to um, uh, over, over the course of this presentation. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Corbin. And thank you, sir. So uh, we are deeply concerned about the well-being of teachers and students in this challenging time. And so as you look at this video, I'd like you to think about how we can provide hope during a pandemic. I understand that Chile is a country that has more coastline than many other countries in the entire world. And so I did the work and discovered you have horseshoe crabs. But I'm curious to know if you actually knew the importance of horseshoe crabs, as it relates to COVID. So uh, imagine how inspiring this might be to your students. So how do we provide hope during a pandemic is the thrust here. So this is a horseshoe crab, uh, belief in this, and uh, it is more related to spiders. People actually think it's a crab, but it's more related to spiders. But, uh, these things are really important for us. Uh, they're going to definitely play a role in COVID. Their blood contains amoebocytes. By the way, their blood is light blue because it contains copper, uh, but absolutely beautiful. They actually harvest blood. They do baby blue blood drives every year here in Charleston, South Carolina, because it is used when they do trials with medicine. The amoebocytes will actually help combat bacteria. So basically, every medicine you've ever had, anything you've ever had, medical device, you can thank these guys, and they'll definitely again play a role in COVID. 
this is a horseshoe crab. These guys have been around for 450 million years. And take a look at how devastating the damage was to the shell. The shell is uh, a form of cellulose called white. And, uh, but this is another indicator that the amoeba sites can help them to make it through for the most part. But these guys have been here since before the dinosaurs. They'll be here hopefully long after we are. But uh, unfortunately, 15% of them die when they are harvested for their blood. Uh, they take their blood, take them to the laboratory, clean them off. Uh, you know, corporations like Pfizer and others, and then uh, they put them back. Thank goodness, Pfizer has developed a synthetic form of their blood that contains the amoebocytes that can go through pharmaceutical trials and so forth. So uh, my friends make fun of me all the time and say, Robert, you'll pick up anything. And, you know, that's pretty much true. Uh, so you will see as we progress through the presentation that that is true. So uh, I love this thinking as well. So it's really important to, to notice, to experience, uh, to, to, you know, actually engage with living things. I love this quote by Aldo Leopold. He said, the first law of intelligent tinkering is to save all of the parts. If we actually care about preservation of the world, we need to provide students with experiences, direct experiences with things so that they actually care. So uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dr. Stout where you can talk about connect a connection within the TDI. So um, when the virus hit, um, one of the things that Discovery Education and did was we created uh, a unique channel to help students and teachers understand uh, about the virus and its implications. So this was a, this is available uh, free of charge to all of our customers um, and to districts that had never really used Discovery before. So um, we wanted to make sure that, that uh, everyone had access to this. So think about using that uh, little short video that um, Dr. Corbin shared as a way to introduce students to this concept of how those vaccines are developed. Um, you know, we hear, we hear about all the different kinds of vaccines, um, but what is the science behind those vaccines and how do we create those vaccines? <clears throat> and something like the horseshoe crab with its unique blood type um, or, or blood type of blood um, is a great example of, of how um, we use what's available in nature to help us develop vaccines for humans. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Corbett. That's excellent. By the way, thank you, Dr. Stout. He, he just reminded me that this entire presentation, including the videos, will be made available to you. So you will have links to the activities that he's discussing and to these videos. So I want to talk very quickly about the importance of going outdoors. Above and beyond using material that are available in your home, why should we do this? Well, this is research from the Aspen Institute. Look at all of the benefits that accrue if you take your kids outside. They're less likely to be obese. They will have higher test scores, less likely to use drugs, to uh, you know, have risky sex, uh, more likely to go to college. They will earn more money. They will have lower health costs, more productive at work reduced likelihood of stroke, cancer, or diabetes, and most importantly, the very end, the arrow, it becomes something that a family uh, imparts to their children. So it becomes this cycle over and over and over again. So it's really important to think about going outdoors. Um, really important to think about uh, what are the benefits of outdoor learning too. If you look at these, uh, these are actually research-based as well, and they're in the notes. Number one, it improves school performance, attitudes, behavior. Uh, it is physically uh, and mentally and socially healthy. It supports your child's development, sense of empathy, independence, problem solving. It's a way to engage the families with the community, helps to develop a sense of place and civic attitudes. Most important is that it's fun, right? Don't apologize for wanting to have your kids have fun. So we're gonna go forth. I love this particular activity and this idea because every human being I know is curious about this. What causes a rainbow? Um, and if you happen to have glue sticks in your home, I think you're gonna love this activity. This is a way to connect to the physics of light by using glue sticks. So by the way, you're gonna see my son in some of these videos. 
we all know that the children of teachers get abused. They're always forced to volunteer. So I hope that you enjoy this. So what causes a rainbow is a question that I would ask your students to think about if you were to use this video. Enjoy this. Hi, it's Malachi Corbin. And have you ever wondered why the sunset is red and the sky is blue? Well, that has to do with the scattering of light, which we're going to do our experiment on today. So for this experiment, you're going to need a pen light, pen flashlight, or just a miniature flashlight. You're going to need a clear glue stick. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting the mini flashlight up to the clear glue stick and shining a little light through it. And we're going to see different colors being scattered. So the first part of this experiment is actually getting all the clear glue sticks we need. So I put them in ascending order, one glue stick, two, three, and four. And to put together the two, three, and four combinations of glue sticks, you're gonna to need to just use regular scotch tape and tape them together at the ends, which is very simple and easy to do. All right, so now we're gonna actually shine the light through the glue sticks in ascending order, starting with only one clear glue stick. So that is the first glue stick. Now we're going to move on to two. That's the second glue stick. Here we go on to three. That's the third glue stick and the last one. So you'll notice, obviously, there's some color difference. So we're going to start off with one again. One, you can see it's pretty yellow. Moving on to two. You can see that it starts to change a little bit from yellow to an orangish, a kind of light orangish color. And once we go to the third one, you can see a kind of major difference. So it goes from yellow to light orange to kind of a darker, more very, very tiny amount of red. And then to the final one, it goes from yellow to a light orange to a red to a kind of very faint dark red, but it's still there. So it's very interesting to see the color changes from only one Okay, I'm going to truncate that. If I were to do this with students, by the way, I would let them experiment with the glue sticks to figure out which ones of them would scatter the light. But you know that sort you know sort of uh, explains why light is uh, spread out. So where uh, might you find this? We'll get that to in a moment. You know, uh, to that in a moment. Uh, I'd love to show this image very quickly. Uh, the importance of curiosity again. So I used to be the vice president of a science museum and I took pride in going and looking at programs when they were being set up. Well, here is a student in the museum who's looking at me with a plasma ball. You may have seen a plasma ball. You plug them in and you can see electricity pulsating through them. This is the picture of the student while I am setting up the plasma ball. I want you to notice what happens once I plug it in and I touch my wrist to the plasma ball and it starts to pulsate the electricity. I want you to see what happens here. I love that image so much. I love that. This is where we are aiming to go. We want to inspire students, we want them to be wonder filled and they don't really care about competition in the world yet, right? And in my opinion, nor should they. They should enjoy wonder and curiosity first and then that other stuff will come along. So uh, here's another activity you can do very simply at home. All you need is milk, a pan, dish soap, and a cotton ball. So I want you to enjoy this. This one I think is quite inspiring. I hope that you like it as much as I do. This experiment is dedicated to my little cousins, Lonnie and Lorenzo. I'm going to stop that one short as well. You get the idea. 
there are so many things happening here mathematically and scientifically. You know, uh, it is okay to have your kids observe phenomena without a question and then allow their question to drive their learning. But, you know, some of the things that I'm thinking about are, wow, is the behavior we're seeing orderly or is it chaotic? You know, what about uh, water loving molecules versus fat loving molecules, lipophilic and hydrophilic? What about osmosis? What about, uh, you know, this whole behavior? How long will it go on? Uh, but, it, you know, we can go on and on. And I'm sure that you also have many questions, too. But uh, to give you a connection within the TDI, I'm going to let Dr. Stout share. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And uh, I do love that demonstration. That's so interesting. And, um, you know, research indicates that um, when you provide students a motivation to read, it increases their comprehension and certainly their interest. So one of the things, when I saw this activity and I, I knew where it connected in, in tech book, um, the first thing I thought of was I would use that activity, that demonstration to draw my students in to this concept of diffusion and osmosis. Um, so think about it, uh, these activities as uh, kind of novel ways to introduce students to the concepts, to motivate them. They'll want to learn more um, after seeing these. So um, this particular one you'll find in eighth grade science textbook um, in the, the action on diffusion and osmosis that are, is being displayed. And there actually is, in addition to that, a similar activity built into the engage section in, in uh, unit 2.4. So you can actually do this with your students. Uh, slightly different than the one you just saw, um, but I guarantee you, they will want to do that same thing. So, um, so think about ways using this as a way to motivate your students to. And with back to Dr. Okay, well, thank you, friends. So I want you to notice something else on this uh, image, and that is that it, we're being systematic here in the TDI, right? We're not just doing a demonstration and leaving it at that. You'll notice the five E model, which is a re research-based model. Right, so it is important not to just uh, do the phenomena. You know, just doing the phenomena alone is not enough. You can see also another connection here, of course, uh, uh, to molecules through the five E model, but uh, that's that's not enough. It's just you know doing things that make you go, oh wow, is not enough. As teachers, we need to connect it to the curriculum. So we have to be a little more systematic. And so we have been demonstrating for you a sequence that I would suggest you think about trying with your students, whether it's in the classroom or at home or with your own kids, you know, what happens if you start with this wonder-based phenomena and then you ask them what questions they might have and what they might want to make or do, then you went into the TDI, you know, in order to explore further, to seek explanations and content, to ask questions, to read about it and discuss it. And then of course, to recycle it all over again. So I think it's a, a powerful, more systematic way to do it. You don't just stop at a demonstration. How do they actually find out answers uh, to their questions? So I'm gonna ask you this question now. Um, I just said, it's really important to think about something that a student can do. So I'm gonna in, uh, encourage you to drop your answers in the chat. How might you move this can without touching it or blowing on it? How might you move this can without touching it or blowing on it? What are your thoughts? I see some great answers in there. Uh, so uh, very, very smart group. Uh, you could uh, touch it with another object. You could actually um, shake the table that it was on. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate for you another idea that you may not have thought of, which is a novel way to get kids into electricity and to get them into static electricity. And then you'll see a fun activity. 
And by the way, I want you to look for the connection to that original cylinder problem that we did at the very beginning. So today I want you to bet your kid that you can move a can without actually touching it. It's a STEM challenge. So here is the key to this challenge. Just take a balloon, get some static electricity going, rubbing on someone's hair. Okay, the last step is to engage your kids in a race with the two charged balloons. You'll notice that I have two different diameter size cans. Let's see if that makes a difference in the race. So one, two, three. <laughs> So you see there are lots of opportunities for mathematics in there as well. The question I might ask students is, how many times do the smaller can need to turn on the table to get to the end of the table? And then of course, why do the race? Because then the kids have to think about what is the way that I can get the maximum static electricity in order to win this competition. So it's a great entry into electricity. I'm gonna let Dr. Stout uh, show you a, a connection to the TDI. Uh, and and uh, what a great way to introduce a concept of static electricity to students. Um, I guarantee you they're going to go home, uh, blow up a balloon, get two cans of soda, and get a, put it on their table and, and uh, try this. Um, Again, a great motivational uh, opportunity. So uh, this is actually a, a section in Unit 3.1 of the Science Textbook that addresses the concept of static electricity. Um, and uh, once again, the motivation is there for students to want to learn more about it um, and to try other experiments that uh, that allow them to see the the wonder of static electricity. Uh, it's such a common thing that all students are aware of, but they may not realize uh, how powerful that it can be. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Corbin. Thank you so much. So here's a question I would love for you to entertain. Um, how can you actually engage kids to understand the diversity of life? What are the various ways that uh, plants have adaptations for reproduction and survival? And you know, how do they actually grow? Well, anybody can do this activity if you just put on a couple of pairs of socks and you walk through a field. So uh, again, you will see my son and I hope that you enjoy this. So what would happen to student understanding if we embraced something concrete through discovery? So here we go. Just take a plastic bag, put it over. Now we're gonna seal the bag, make sure that no air can get in very quickly using some transparent tape. We're going to come back in a little while and check to see what happens inside of this bag after some time goes by. So what is your prediction? What is going to happen? And then more important for educators, what do you think students would think of this particular experience? So there you go. You have some leaves inside of a shrub in the yard. You seal it off. We're going to come back couple of hours and see what it is that we observe. So take advantage of any abandoned field that you might have in your neighborhood to run experimentation and to do discovery. So this is what my poor guinea pig college student son is going to do. I'm going to have him run through this field for five minutes wearing nothing but his socks. So the big idea here is how do plants travel? I think that we're going to get a little bit hooked on curiosity because I think we're going to see something hanging on his socks, but we'll discover and find out. So learning through discovery, too much fun. So here's the plastic bag less than a half hour later. Come back and check it. You can see it's all foggy. We even have accumulation of water on the edge of the bag. 
we'll come back. Let's see if uh, we actually, oh, here's a sample of what happens after about five minutes of Elijah walking through a field, an abandoned field. You can see amazing diversity of seeds, quite a strategy for survival, reproduction, and growth, right? So seeds do, in fact, travel. Uh, they just latch on. So uh, there are devices, by the way, that will allow you to look at things even closer. Your phone is one of those incredible devices, but there's things that you can use to magnify even further, which I'll show you in one moment. But you can see, wow, quite a diversity of things. Here's an opportunity to talk about patterns in nature as well, but also connect this concretely to photosynthesis. So here, here is one of the devices that actually allows you to look even closer. And uh, again, they're less than 10 bucks. I'm going to say like $7.99 through Amazon. You actually have a stage. You just clip it on your phone. And you have a stage which has a light. You can actually, well, just show us the night light. You can actually switch it so you have light that works in the evening too. Uh, sort of purple, non-obtrusive light, so you can look at things really, really closely. Another device, which is pretty cool, is this device. This one's really, really stable. You can't clip it on your phone, but it has multiple magnifications, has light, etc. So you can have your kids look at things really closely. So this is showing you what those objects look like really close up. That shows you through the phone. In my experience, kids want to do anything that uh, allows them to use their phone. So it's a really cool way to do science in the field with handheld devices. Um, and by the way, so the bag on the plant, if I were to ask you, what are the products and reactants of photosynthesis, only a few of you would know. And so the reason I put that bag over the plant is to make it concrete. That shows transpiration. It shows water uh, being given off by the plant through the process of photosynthesis. So uh, this one, I'm going to show you very quickly before I do this, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to show you a video having to do with scales, having to do with layering of scales. Well, when I was a teacher, a high school teacher, I, I have learned from uh, Bernardita and Roberto and others that you don't have a whole lot of venomous snakes in Chile, but I still want to give this disclaimer. Don't handle snakes unless you can identify them. So I was a high school teacher and I was out in the field and I was doing quadrants, setting up areas and counting the diversity of plants. And uh, because I wanted to be scientifically accurate, I sent kids to various places on the campus. Well, guess what? Of course, one of the kids was bitten by a venomous snake in North Carolina called a copperhead. It bit him right here in the hand between his thumb and his index finger. His hand was the size of a football. I'll never forget, this dates me, but I called my wife from the payphone in the hallway of my school and I said, honey, I am so sorry. I love you. I'm going to be fired from my job today because the, uh, he, you know, this student was bitten by a snake and had to go to the hospital. So anyway, all of that is to say, make sure before you pick up snakes, you can identify them. So enjoy this. Here's another idea for just teaching kids to be observant. Check out this beautiful guy or gal. This is right along on Holly Huntersville Road in North Charlotte. Beautiful, beautiful snake. Take a look at the scales. Talk about that in the next clip. Beautiful guy. Snakes are imbricated. Imbrication is found throughout nature as a structure and function for survival, reproduction, and growth. So here is a camisipris leaf, which is a pine. Most people know them as cypress. You can see overlaying scales. All imbrication means is scale. They can also be seen in pine cones. So if you look at pine cones, almost all pine cones have scales. So as you think about scales, imbrication, 
besides snakes, trees, where else would you find imbrication? Ask your kids to look very, very closely around the yard in the neighborhood for imbrication. An obvious one, of course, on the shingles of a roof. But look elsewhere, imbrication is represented everywhere, which kind of indicates it's a successful strategy for survival. As you teach kids to observe things carefully, encourage them to remember scales. We were not feathers are also imbricated scale that overlap. And if you look at it at the microscopic level, it's very obvious, but it's at the macroscopic level too. You can see that these are definitely overlapping one another. And so imbrication again is all over nature. Have kids observe very, very close. Like so. And then have them intentionally zoom out in their mind to look at things at the larger scale. So scales are everywhere in biology. You know, one of the things that's on my bucket list is to visit Chile because the diversity of birds is greater there than almost anywhere else in the world. And you can certainly see scales in Chile. So Dr. Stout's gonna show you one of the connections in the TDI to those activities. So yeah, actually there's quite a bit uh, and, and we're the uh, demonstrations there in the video. Um, Unit 2.5 introduces the concepts of photosynthesis. We saw that. Plant reproduction, including how plants have adapted to, to, uh, uh, to allow animals to disperse their seeds. And of course, parts of a plant, which we were just kind of uh, touched on at the end. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that, um, you know, is, is uh, interesting is, and I, I wouldn't be the one to make this, these connections myself necessarily, but there's so much geometry, really, especially when you think about uh, the introduction or what the, that very last uh, demonstration of scales um, and overlapping scales. Uh, I just saw so much, uh, so much potential to introduce math concepts as well. Um, it also, uh, doing something like this prior to reading, once again, um, also helps students better understand a concept because it provides a context for learning. Um, they, they've they've kind of got a little taste of it and then they can read about it and they'll, they'll, they're actually will comprehend more deeply as a result. That's excellent. Thank you. So I love Thank that. You, sir. I love that reference to uh, uh, patterns in nature, Dr. Stout. That's uh, something I hadn't even thought about. Love that. Friends, uh, so uh, I'd like you to just contemplate what questions your students might have about uh, phenomena. Uh, that phenomena or any phenomena, feel free to use the chat in order to do that. Uh, I want to just uh, talk about one last idea, and that is just the importance of noticing. Uh, so you all have, of course, all uh, heard of Leonardo da Vinci. It turns out that Leonardo da Vinci had, you know, 30 or more words that he used to describe the behavior of water. And guess what? He didn't know this when he was making these observations and drawing in his notebook. But the, uh, the uh, circles the curls that are actually in water actually end up being represented in his art. If you look at the Mona Lisa very carefully, you can see the swirls of water represented in his artwork. So I'd like to take you through this activity right here. I'd love you to be Leonardo for a moment. Describe water, uh, give descriptive words, the properties and the behavior as you watch this little short video. Of course, anybody can access a rainstorm so uh, if you will, drop in the chat descriptive words, cross-cutting concepts, and behavior that describe this water. So enjoy this and drop those words in.
I love this, by the way. You just made me realize what a great way to use descriptive words to teach between languages, because I, I see expression, I see precision, I see cascada, uh, fuerza. I, uh, so many great ways to think about uh, how language beautifully describes phenomena. So very, very well done. Uh, we all have a bit of phenomena uh, in us and a bit of Leonardo in us. So again, Dr. Stout, did you want to chat about where this might be reinforced in the TDI? Actually, I, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> um, we included this again with uh, the concept of um, uh, diffusion with raindrops. Um, and uh, certainly there, there could be some implications or some, some ways to integrate it there. But what I really loved about that was uh, the integration of art. Um, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, we, like you alluded to earlier, STEM in its real form um, integrates multiple disciplines because you can't solve problems with just science and math. Um, you know, the other disciplines really do um, integrate beautifully. And, uh, and I love the fact that our STEM activities do that in, in science uh, and math type work. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Stout. So let's move forth. Uh, it is really, really important to, um, again, engage in curiosity and to make connections across disciplines. So here's a connection within science, you know, you know jumping from art to the physics uh, and the polarity of water. You can see I dropped in this little diagram that shows that water actually has a positive and negative end. Here's something you can do in your kitchen to demonstrate a connection between physics and the static energy electricity activity that we did and the art. This is so simple to do. All you need is a plastic hanger and a wool scarf and you can actually bend water. So enjoy this. Hi, it's Elijah Corbin. And for the experiment today, all you're gonna need is a plastic hanger and a wool hat or scarf anything wool. So to do this, you're going to need to put the wool, whatever you have item around the plastic hanger. You're just going to have to rub it a little bit, kind of create a little bit of static electricity. And once you do that for a little bit, we have a little running water here. Once you do that enough, see the water start to bend a little bit from its normal track. Mm -hmm. So again, all really simple activities that you can do pretty much uh, at home. And uh, Dr. Stout may want to make a, another connection here. Yeah, I think the slide was probably <laughs> to be earlier, um, but yeah. uh, but I, you know, going back to the static electricity uh, example, that's such a cool demonstration. By the way, I love it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just the concept of static electricity, going back to that uh, textbook, uh, I think this particular example is in there, but, uh, but again, I, I can just see students being motivated to want to learn more about it as a result. That's excellent. By the way, so you can see that uh, there's also a geometric connection because of the angle between the hydrogens and the oxygens there, uh, which is why I dropped that additional image in there. But uh, it has been a privilege to be with you. I recognize that we are probably two minutes over. And uh, if you would like me to, I would uh, love to show you one more video, but I want to thank all, uh, all of you in Chile. I thank you for the privilege of your time. I, I hope to actually visit you someday in person. Uh, if, you, if you have the time, I'd love to share one or the other, either uh, videos, uh, a video on fireflies or a video on the third eyelid of the toad called the dictating membrane. So if you wanna drop in the chat, which one you would like to see, or if you need to drop, uh, I understand that as well. I wanna treat you as a professional. If you need to uh, go be with your family or continue your work, I understand that as well. Would you rather see the toad or would you rather see the uh, firefly? 
Number two, okay, so the toad. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the toad. Both, Mark, toad. Mark, they, they wanna see both. Oh, they wanna see both, <laughs> okay. I love that about them. Okay, well, you know what? I am going to start the toad over again. We'll do the toad first, and then we'll do the firefly. I, I love your curiosity and your interest. That is wonderful. Thank you for that. I, it, it's warming for me to know that other people are interested in this crazy stuff besides me. So thank you. So this is a toad. Why not take the kids out in the yard and check out what you have? I want to take a look at the eye. Uh, toads have actually many amphibians have what's called the nictitating membrane which is a third eyelid, not the bottom eyelid or the top eyelid, but an eyelid that goes over the eye to protect it while it eats. So let's see if we can see that. I'm gonna just touch the top of its head, blink. Let's see if we can see it. By the way, this is probably a fowler's toad. The way you tell the difference between the East Coast between a fowler's toad and an American toad is count the number of bumps per dark spot. So this has three or four bumps per dark spot. So it's probably a fowler's toad. By the way, every time you pick up a toad, it's likely to urinate on you as a defense mechanism. Just wash your hands afterwards. So this is a pretty cool guy. Uh, and uh, these are, you know, amphibians are relatively scarce because of um, you know, the chytrid fungus. So uh, this is special to be able to see an amphibian. Let your kids. Hold these carefully. There's nothing that quite replaces holding a toad, but just be very, very careful and be willing to let it go when you're done. So I'm gonna let him go. Hi, I am Elijah Corbin, and you see the small pink structure in the corner of my eye. That is a nictitating membrane. And a nictitating membrane is actually a vestigial structure, which is a former remnant of a structure. And what other organisms or animals do you know that have a nictitating membrane? So interesting to me, by the way, another reason I want to come to Chile is because of the number of amphibians that you have, but why would you have a third eyelid? By the way, raptors and other birds also have uh, that third eyelid. So I'm privileged to live in a place in North Carolina where we have fireflies that blink in synchronicity. I challenge you, this is wonderful. I challenge you to explain scientifically how it is that these insects know to blink at the exact same time. So enjoy this. These are fireflies in North Carolina. So we actually have a jar of fireflies. That's a misnomer. Fireflies are actually from the order of Coleoptera, which is the most abundant order of organisms that there are. Uh, it's actually a soft bodied beetle and this captures your imagination. The light comes from a substance called luciferase. Is that not colorful and fantastic? Luciferase. And uh, these are most uh, uh, efficient in terms of production of light of anything in nature. We can be inspired by them because magnesium in the presence of adenine triphosphate, ATP, actually create this light and it's really really efficient i'm hoping we can actually see one of them light up in the jar oh, there we go we're going to hold out for one more uh, if you haven't done this with your kid this is just wonderful by the way north carolina and southeast asia a few of the places in the world where one of the most extraordinary phenomena that i know of occurs it will actually light up in synchronicity how would you explain that? Extraordinary. So you can see this in Tennessee and North Carolina in the first couple of weeks of June. So I'm hoping that we can get one of them to light up. Come on, guys. Cooperate for us. And then we'll, of course, let them go. Anyway, there we go. Anyway, get your kids outside catching. So this is a a privilege to be with you, of course, uh, just to show that you can be observant and uh, do science anywhere that you are. This is me earlier today with the lichen uh, in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, lichen is an indicator of ozone in the atmosphere. 
as you can see, I brought a couple of quadrants. Yes, I travel with the quadrants. I know that makes me a nerd, right? But you can actually do mathematical studies. You know, what is the percentage of the rock that is covered with a particular species of lichen? And the lichen indicates the presence or absence of ozone. So in this particular location in Bar Harbor, very little atmospheric 